a man phones his local pizza place and the man says, Hi, can I have a pizza with liver and onions, please? <clears throat> the man at the pizza place says, Sorry, sir, we don't do liver. The man with his hand over the phone whispers to his wife, Honey, I thought you said that they do the liver. The wife said, No, babe, I said that they do deliver. The husband said, Well, not according to this chap. <laughs> Thank you, you're much too kind today. Now, I got thinking the other day, given that a radiator is essentially a vital organ to a car, it's strange that, you know, in the movie Cars with Lightning McQueen, a Disney production, that in that particular movie, the town was called Radiator Springs. Hmm, that's weird. That would be like if we called a city, I don't know, something like maybe mm, Liverpool. <laughs> Hi everybody, it's Dr. Ryan here again with yet another algorithm in internal medicine. This is our 34th in total and our second in gastroenterology. Thank you for joining me. You know, it's always a pleasure speaking about medicine with you guys. Hope that you're all well. Thank you to those who have been liking and sharing my videos. If you haven't yet subscribed to my YouTube channel, what are you waiting for, man? Today we're addressing uh, 25 diverse etiologies behind cholestatic liver injury. But I thought before we get there, let's quickly talk about uh, jaundice. <clears throat> so how do we classify jaundice? We, we describe it as being either prehepatic, inter- or post-hepatic, right, in terms of the uh, pathobiology, right? So prehepatic largely has to do with destruction of red cells, manifesting as anemia, all right? And the clues there is that, um, you know, your, your LDH will be up, your cones will be up depending on whether you're looking at autoimmune process. Okay, you have to go maybe low, all right. And largely, this can be either hemolytic or non hemolytic in nature. So, we're looking at transfusion reactions, sickle cell anemia, thalassemia, autoimmune disease, and so forth. Hepatic refers to some process in the liver that is giving rise to the jaundice, right? And here, usually, you have a rise in your transheminases, your um, Aniline aminotransferase and the aspartate aminotransferase, ART, AST, right? And we speak to usually hepatitis, cancer, cirrhosis, congenital disorders, drugs, anything in the liver. post has to do with the process of fitting the bloody ductal system outside the liver, right? And here we have usually a rise in ductal enzymes, alkaline phosphatase, gamma glutamate transferase, otherwise known as 5' nucleotidase, and your bilirubin, direct bilirubin is going to be high. What causes this is gallstones, inflammation, scar tissue, or tumors which blocked the flow of bile into the intestine. This is courtesy of the guys over at midcomic.com. Thank you so much, Mr. George Muniz and company. Okay, let's get going. Cholestatic liver injury refers to the predominance of the serum alkaline phosphatase elevation in comparison with the serum aminotransferases. Serum bilirubin levels are usually also elevated. Diseases of the hepatic biliary system and bone are the most common causes of elevated serum alkaline phosphatase. Now, elevated serum gamma glutamate transferase, also known as 5' nucleotidase, can confirm a hepatobiliary source of alkphos elevation. Clinical manifestations of cholestasis largely depend on unlike cause but include pruritus, fatigue, dark colored urine, acolic or pale stool, same thing, jaundice, and palpable dilatation of the gallbladder. Cholestasis can essentially be extrahepatic, as we see on the left here, or intrahepatic. Sorry about the typo there. This is cholestasis, not cholestasis. Uh, the presence of dilated bullary ducts on imaging suggests extrahepatic cholestasis. That's your big money-throwing clue, right? You've got bullary ducts on imaging, which points to extrahepatic cholestasis. Now, extrahepatic cholestasis can occur as a result of obstruction of a large amount of ducts related to either uh, pancreatic or pulmonary system. And intrahepatic cholestasis we can substratify as being either obstructive, toxic, and facial. Let's dig into this. 10 causes of extrahepatic cholestasis which has pulmonary duct dilation and ultrasound. We split them into pulmonary versus pancreatic. So pulmonary cholidocolithiasis is basically gallstones that get trapped in the bile duct. Okay, you can have uh, strictures in the bile ducts which we can see on ERCP, right? Malignancy, uh, especially you know, um, cholangiomas, liver fluke, right, ascariasis, cholidocal cysts, right, so those six things. Then if looking at extrahepatic cholestasis due to pancreatic involvement, here we look at acute and chronic pancreatitis, pancreatic pseudocysts, and pancreatic cancer. I mean, we all know that the main cause of acute pancreatitis is it's between ethanol and gallstone, but also trauma, steroids, mums, antinuclear factor, uh, sometimes copy of venom, uh, post-ERCP, drugs, um, and don't forget hypertrichosidemia as well, all right? 
Intrahepatic cholestasis largely divided into obstructive versus toxic versus infectious, and then obstructive we think of malignancy, PVC, which is primary biliary cholangitis. The nomenclature has changed over the last few years. It was PVC called primary biliary cirrhosis. Then we have primary sclerosing cholangitis, cystic fibrosis, infiltrative disease. We're thinking about amyloid and sarcoid, sickle cell disease. Don't forget post transplant complication, graft versus host disease. Eight possible causes of an obstructive uh, etiology. There, it could be toxic to the liver, and usually this manifests as a mix between urease transaminases and urease ductal enzymes. But usually the cholestatic picture predominates. Okay, what they call a so-called infiltrative hepatitis. Okay, so here we're looking at medications that can cause it, pregnancy, alcohol, as well as total parenteral nutrition. Infectious causes as well can give rise to intrahepatic cholestasis, right? Like sepsis, very important, uh, often bacterial in etiology. Viral hepatitis can do it, yes, and TB, TB, and TB. Watch out for that, right? Okay. So, um, let's uh, just go over a quick OSCE case. This one taken from the Mayo Clinic again. So, a 55 year old woman reports an eight month history of fatigue, malodorous, loose stools, diffuse pruritus, and non tender prominence of the right abdomen. Which of the following blood tests is the most useful for establishing the diagnosis? Right, is it anti mitochondrial antibodies, anti smooth antibodies? Uh, sorry, anti-smooth muscle antibodies, anti-nuclear antibodies, anti-double standard DNA antibodies, or is it ferritin? So obviously we can see that she's quite jaundiced, okay? And she has probably pruritus as well. So the answer here is going to be A, anti-mitochondrial antibodies, because what we're looking at here is primary biliary cirrhosis, right? This is a chronic cholestatic liver disease, affects middle-aged women uh, primarily, Signs and symptoms include fatigue, pruritus, loose stool, jaundice, dental asthma, hepatomegaly. An asymptomatic increase in the level of alkaline phosphatase may be the first identifiable abnormality. And you know, it keeps bad company, man. It keeps bad company. Some patients also have Hashimoto's thyroiditis or Sika syndrome together with uh, PVC. All right, circulating anti mitochondrial antibodies occur in some 90 to 95 percent of patients. Liver biopsy will reveal granulomatous inf uh, infiltration and destruction of the small bile ducts. The management is urso deoxycholic acid, which delays the need for liver transplantation. We affectionately call that urso tan, and cholecystamine may alleviate the pruritus. All right, okay, so just a bit of motivation for you this morning. Today, I just want to encourage you against pride. Okay, there was uh, 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 an author. H. Wiener, who said, and I quote, Remember, when the peacock struts his stuff, he shows his backside to half the world. All right. Now, what does the Bible have to say concerning pride and humility? I just want to outline three scriptures for you. The book of Proverbs, chapter 16, verse 18, says that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. The book of James, chapter 4, verse 6, says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. In Matthew, Chapter 20, uh, 20, sorry, verse 26 and 27, Jesus says, Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servants, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So if you want to be great, we have to descend. We have to be the servant of all. We have to be humble, okay? So I pray and I hope that you will make that decision to be humble, and God will bless you richly. Okay, have a fantastic day. I'll see you tomorrow with another algorithm in gastroenterology. Take care.